So welcome to New America Foundation. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Sasha Meinrath, and I run the Open Technology Institute here. Uh, New America is sort of a, well, we call it sort of a pan-partisan think tank spanning a lot of different issues from uh, budget and fiscal debt to health care and, of course, telecom and spectrum and broadband in particular. And today, uh, we're going to be talking about some of my favorite issues of all time. In fact, these, these are issues that brought me to Washington, D.C., and I can say five years later that I'm still uh, cautiously optimistic uh, in spite of what I'm about to say, which is that, you know, when I look at the last several years, and I've only been through three chairmen now, but, uh, you know, when I, when I look at uh, television white space, dynamic spectrum access, unlicensed, additional unlicensed spectrum, these are all kind of stalled out right now. It's not that we're losing these battles, it's just that we're not really making a lot of headway in them. When I look at low power FM radio, you know, we've had this 10 year battle to get back to where we were at around the turn of the millennium. And when I look at the national broadband plan, the national broadband map, and current broadband uh, measurement efforts, uh, three areas that we've been integrally in involved in since the very get-go, um, I'm kind of shocked. I'm shocked by what passes for mission accomplished here in D.C. vis-a-vis -vis what the reality is internationally. And you can blame the FCC. I certainly would lay blame at the feet of certain members of the FCC. And you can blame kind of the nepotism and the revolving door that is quite uh, explicit at the FCC. But I would actually say that our role is really to demand more of ourselves, uh, to demand more of Republicans and Democrats alike, to actually formulate kind of what it is that we are going to do to fix things, both at places like the FCC, but also on our own. And I think one of the problems, you know, I think about this in terms of my two-year-old now. It seems like a lot of life now revolves around her. And if I were to praise her as much as we do the FCC, if I were to give her a free pass every time she throws a temper tantrum or does something that's thoroughly unacceptable, I'd end up with a, a really petulant, spoiled child. And I kind of feel like, yeah, the FCC sort of acts like a spoiled brat a lot of the times. Uh, it wants praise. It gets really angry when you withhold praise. And so I would say that the FCC actually needs better parenting. And when I look at AT&T, like, they're not going to do it. And when I think about, like, Comcast, National Association of Broadcasters, I'm like, they clearly are not going to do it. And so for better and worse, it's sort of our responsibility to add that kind of guidance. And so that's why I'm excited for the gathering that's here today. Because when I think about where this form of advice and guidance, a framework that the FCC so desperately needs, is going to come from, it's going to come from the people here in this room. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ellen to kick off the awesomeness that's about to transpire. And I very much look forward to today's discussions. Thank you. Okay, the awesomeness begins um, with Larry Irving, and we're especially delighted that he could join us today and provide some introductory perspective on our topic. Larry now runs an international telecom consulting firm, the Irving Information Group. His public service includes uh, almost seven years as administrator of the Commerce Department's National Telecommunications and Information uh, Administration, NTIA, where he was a principal advisor to President Clinton and Vice President Gore, on IT and telecom issues during a period of fundamental change to telecom regulations and the birth of the internet. In that role, he was all about making markets more efficient and also resolving the occasional failure of markets to serve the underserved in rural and poor America. In fact, Larry is widely credited with coining the term digital divide and with devising strategies to close it. Now, the Talmud tells us that you don't have to complete the work but neither are you at liberty to desist from it. Larry didn't complete the work of closing the digital divide, 
but nor has he desisted from trying to. He's going to talk a little bit about what he sees on the ground in terms of social and public interest imperatives in today's wireless world. And then after that, in the first panel, we'll talk about how we might understand some of these imperatives as uh, uh, we migrate from broadcast to broadband environments. Larry. Um, it's, it's like a homecoming for me to come here today. I see so many people I've worked with um, um, or worked for um, in this room. Um, Bonnie is sitting in the front row, and Bonnie and I did some great work working with Secretary Ron Brown um, with the National Information Infrastructure Advisory Committee. Only government can come up with a title like that. Um, normally, I, I, I try to read my comments off of my, my mobile device, but as I've gotten older, I have more eye problems, so I'm going to actually go back to paper. Um, I had printed out this morning because I realized I couldn't see that and I couldn't get, get the font um, high enough, and I'm also going to take off my glasses, so if I don't make eye contact, it's not that I don't love you, I've been having some eye problems recently. Um, I want to thank the New America Foundation in Rutgers, um, and, and, I, and I want to commend Sasha and Michael for the work that they've done with the Wireless Future Initiative and the Open Technology Initiative. And I particularly want to thank my good friend, uh, Professor Goodman, for inviting me here today. We've been friends for just about two decades. Um, I, I admire her so much for her work, for her intellect, and particularly her character. Uh, she didn't mention, but I will, that I tried to steal her from uh, um, a law firm she was working with about 35 times. She kept telling me no, um, and the government's loss was academia's gain, because she's done some remarkable work since leaving Washington and while she was in Washington. Let me start with a, com a caveat that you have to when you're a consultant. I have a lot of clients. Um, they're on all sides of every issue. Um, and so any comments I make this morning are purely my own. Um, I sit on PBS's board. I work with some carriers. I have some individual companies. Um, but most of my, 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 my um, different clients have very different perspectives. From broadcast to broadband. I wanted to change it from Brooklyn to broadcast to broadband, and you'd pretty much have my life. Um, I was born in Brooklyn um, in the projects, and I, I like to tell people that because it, I think it's a, testimo a testimony to America that you can be born in Brooklyn in 1955 in the projects um, and have had the kind of opportunities I've had. And most of my life has been about trying to make sure that every kid wherever they're born in Brownsville, New York, or Brownsville, Texas, has the same opportunities that I've had. I, I started 30 years ago working for Mickey Leland. Um, and then I went on to Ed Markey, and then I went on to the clinton Gore administration, and then I did a dot-com with Magic Johnson, and I have my consulting firm, and almost all of it's been about the same thing. There is so much the technology can do, and how can we do it better and do it better for more people? The promise of broadband technology, I think, gets us closest to the realization of, that, of, of what we want. But we're not there yet. But I think we can get there, and I think we can get there together. And I, and, and I worry that far too often we're fighting each other instead of pulling together. And that's why this conference today is so critically important, why it's at a critically important time. I, I was up till 2 o'clock in the morning talking to some friends, um, actually about 1.30, and then thinking until 2, talking to friends out in the valley. I spend most of my time. I spent about half my time of my life outside of Washington, and I spent about half of that time either in New York or um, in New York. If you didn't think I was in New York, there you go, uh, in New York or in Silicon Valley. Um, I went to school in the Valley, I have a lot of friends in the Valley, and until a year ago, um, I worked for Hewlett Packard uh, running the Global Government Affairs. So last night I was on the phone with a friend who's a serial entrepreneur out in the Valley, and earlier this weekend, um, and last week, I was talking to some medical technologists that I met in New York City, and then I was, um, talking last week with a young man I met from Brownsville, Texas, who I met at South by Southwest. He's facing most of the same problems that folks in my hometown in Brownsville, New York are facing, except in New York it, it's, it's increasingly um, um, African Americans, Hasidic Jews, um, um, Puerto Ricans, and Dominicans in Brownsville, Texas is disproportionately um, folks who speak Spanish because they're Mexican American. And then over the last two days, I participated in or attended a series of conferences. In each one of those conferences, I was thinking about this conference because I knew I was talking to friends and, and, and people I know and, and, and respect. Last Friday, there was a conference on spectrum at an inflection point. What are we going to do about spectrum? How are we going to get more spectrum into the system? Then I was at a conference last week. If you look at what's happening in, in this country with obesity, one of the worst things about obesity is that it's creating a society of diabetics. And I was at a conference on diabetes design, where people are using technology to fight diabetes in really, really compelling and, and provocative ways. And then yesterday, um, I was over at um, 
Educational Software, uh, ed uh, Entertainment Software Association, Mike Gallagher, my successor at NTI 8 runs, and they invited me to give a talk on, ed, uh, on ed, to be on a panel to talk about EdTech. At their core, every one of these conferences is about the same thing. They're about broadband. And more specifically, they were about mobile broadband. And how do we marshal the power of broadband to affect economic change, change in healthcare outcomes, and change in educational and economic opportunity? The first speech I ever wrote, as a, for anyone, um, was regarding the public interest, and that was for Congressman Mickey Leland, who was then chairman, about to become chairman of the Black Caucus. That was 1983. It's almost 30 years ago. And I remember vividly sitting up on a Saturday night in February of 1987, snowing outside. I'm sitting in House Annex 2, and I was writing a speech for Ed Markey on exactly the same thing, the public interest. It's February 1987, and Ed was giving a speech about Everett Parker. And all of us who know of the great work, anything we're doing today, we're standing on the shoulders of Ed, Ed Parker. He probably did more about the public interest than anybody we can, we, can, we can ever hope to think about. For both Ed and for Mickey, for Ron Brown, my subsequent boss, public interest standard mattered. And there were three critical things. And I don't care how you transform the language or how you move things around, there are basically three things we're talking about when we're talking about um, the public interest standard. Universal service, diversity, and localism. Anything you do, if you pull out, you know, you, you may tweak it, you may change it around, but that's really what we're talking about. Diversity is diversity of views, diversity of voices, diversity of owners, and diversity in the employment pool. You know, when, when we were able in 1984, Mickey Leland, Tim Worth, Carter's Collins get EEO regulations that were really meaningful in the Cable Act, it had a spillover effect into lots of industries, and a lot of the folks you see, black, brown, and women who are doing great things today, got their start because of those kind of work that Mickey and Carter did. The focus on universal service led to work on lifeline telephone service and extending the reach of broadcasting to rural areas. And then later in my career, the work I did on the digital divide, that was, came right out of what I was taught by Mickey Leland with regard to universal service. And then localism has been critical to tying communities together, promoting local perspectives and views, and serving the needs of disparate and discrete communities. It's all pretty straightforward. It's kind of out of the textbook. But those goals are as critical today as they were then. And the broadband revolution, particularly the mobile revolution, has helped us realize so many of those most aspirational goals. I mean, I go back to Brooklyn. 15 years ago in Brooklyn, 20 to 30 percent of the households in my community, where I grew up, didn't have a phone in that home. Today, 88 percent of America has a mobile phone. There are 323 million smartphones connecting 311 uh, million Americans. I've got two phones and a, um, um, an iPad with me. I've also got a, a MiFi in my briefcase. All right, so I'm doing my part with just, with, I actually have another phone that I don't carry, because I want all the carriers to, when I see my friends, when I go see Tom Chigurh at T-Mobile, <laughs> when I go see Vanya, I want to have I want to phones with all my friends, but, but I have these phones because they have different purposes and they, and they serve different roles, but also candidly, because living in Washington, depending on where I am, I may need the different phones because of, the, of Spectrum Crunch. But we'll get into that in a minute. We've connected, when I talk about those 323 smartphone, million smartphones, that's not laptops, not, you know, this year alone, we're going to sell 100 million tablets, 100 million tablets across the globe this year alone. And tablets didn't exist three years ago. When I first started talking about the digital divide in 1995, one out of 10 households were connected. Today, 88% of people have a mobile device, and most of those devices connect to the net. Virtually everybody, except for folks who, for whatever reason, just we haven't been able to get the message to them that they need to be connected, can be connected. Maybe not the speeds we want, maybe not the way we want, but we can connect them. But the best thing about what we've done is for the first time, communities aren't just content consumers, they're content creators. Some of you are my Facebook friends, and you know I post a lot, and some of you are on my Twitter feed, you know I post a lot. But what I'm trying to post, what I'm trying to bring for people who aren't going to do as much reading as I do, what's happening with regard to laying, um, um, a lesbian, gay, transgender issues on the line, what's happening with the black community, where's happening with regard to the entrepreneurial community. I'm trying to pull my disparate communities into one community, and I'm just one person doing it. You multiply that effect out there when each one of us hits the people we care about and lets them know all the issues they should be thinking about, it gets really exciting. I have friends in China, I have friends in Rome, I have friends in Australia, and I'll, it's interesting the comments I get back from folks. I wouldn't have known that if you hadn't posted that. I'm just one chronicler. Imagine what's happening. And, and when I look at young people, when I was at the educational technology session yesterday, watching these young people become creators, understanding they can create a game, that they can put their own story up there, it takes me back to my days at NHIA when we first connected some schools, and a young girl said, I love the internet because it's not just a window to the outside world, but I can open up that window and tell my story myself. That's the power of what we're doing. But we're also, that's what we wanted, that's what we fought for. And diversity, we've never had more diverse voices across every segment of media. Not what we want to be, but 
What's wonderful about the net is that it removes the barriers to entries and the gatekeepers for the most part. YouTube, last, yesterday, 72 hours of video were uploaded every minute. When you look at the subscribe channels on YouTube, eight of the top 20 are minority um, programmed uh, stations, and 20 to 30 of the top 50, depending upon the day, are also more minority generated or minority um, focused. We've got a long way to go, but trending in the right direction, because what you have to remember, the, these audiences are disproportionately young people. They, they, you know, appointment television is dead. I mean, I'm on PBS's board, and I have these conversations with my colleagues all the time. You know, I watched Downton Abbey. I didn't watch it on TV. I watched it on this. I watched it, you know, I'm, I'm sitting on a train. I'm sitting on a plane. I'm, I'm, I'm downloading out, out, down WTA. I'm watching this. I got to watch it, and I enjoyed watching it. Didn't tell too many people in, back in Brooklyn I was watching it, but, but, I, but I did enjoy it. But I watched, I watched more programming on this thing than I watch on my television at home, because when I'm at home, I'm usually online. So for me, this has been a, th a three decades long journey. And I imagine what Congressman Leland and Secretary Brown would have thought if I told them in the 80s or the 90s what the broadband revolution, and particularly the wireless broadband revolution, would bring. In 15 years, we've engaged and empowered tens of millions of Americans who always were afterthoughts under the old paradigm. Let me go back to those folks I talked about at the beginning of my com comments. And what do they want? And I think I know because in preparing for this talk, I asked them. And let me be honest. They think that not just politicians in Washington are the problem, but Washington's the problem. They think that this environment is toxic. The ones who come here the most often think it's the most toxic. And they think we get t bogged down in intramural squabbles, that we get these thousand-year wars, we get grudges, we get ad hominem, somebody, somebody ticked us off, didn't hire us, didn't do something, and we're still mad 15 years later, we're going to make them pay forever. They see thousand ideological wars, and they want us to continue to support progress and get over ourselves. Now, to my mind, there's one huge impediment to the progress we've just, we've just seen, and that's the need to address the looming scarce, spectrum scarcity. Because the whole issue, everything we've talked about in terms of telecom has always been about scarcity. And then we've talked about abundance. And then we ran into laws of, well, the laws of physics and the laws of economics of building out infrastructure, and we, we, we hit a crunch. 230% increase in mobile data last year. 200, we went 2x. When I, my, my, my wife is one of, I love her to death. She's a, uh, 37 years she's put up with me. She still carries a feature phone. How anybody can still carry a basic feature <laughs> phone and be married to me, I don't understand, but she does. And I think maybe because she's married to me, she does. <laughs> this phone uses nine times more bandwidth than her feature phone. And this thing does 3x more than this thing. And I'm not really that much of a power user in terms of, of, of you know, compared to some of my friends, because I've not hit a cap. All right, so at least I'm doing enough to say, well, actually, that may, may not be true because I'm, I'm grandfathered. But I check, and I've, I wouldn't hit caps even if I wasn't grandfathered. We've got to get more spectrum in the hands of the public, and the greatest, spectrum, the greatest opportunity is the government. Now, NTI runs the government spectrum, and I ran NTI longer than anybody, so I know what's it, what, what we have to do. When I was at NTIA, I didn't do it because I, was, I wanted to. I did it because I was told to. We gave up 235 megahertz and found hundreds of additional megahertz for sharing. Now, I love Anna Gomez and I love Larry Strickling. They have a really difficult job. We found the low-hanging fruit in the 90s. They've got to find some, some fruit in, 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 in 2013. It's going to be harder. But two things I want to talk about. We gave have a 10-year span to do 500 megahertz. We've got to speed up that, folks. 500 megahertz over 10 years is really 500 megahertz over 15 or 20 years. Because first you have to find it. Then you've got to locate it. Then you've got to um, move people out of it. Then you've got to move people into it. Then you've got to build infrastructure. If we really say what we're trying to do is 500 megahertz, given the needs of this country over, over 10 years, we're talking about 20 years. It's going to require the White House, not through oblique comment, but through actual action to get involved and to intercede. Now, now let me tell you about being an assistant secretary. And there are two cool things about being an assistant secretary. One is occasionally you get to fly with the Secretary of Commerce, and you get off a plane with the flag of the United States on some foreign country, and there's nothing cool in walking down those stairs with a secretary behind the secretary. That's great. The second coolest thing, you get a flag. You, you may not know this, but if you're an assistant secretary of the department, you get a flag. I had my little flag hanging in my office, and I loved that flag. I didn't buy that flag because I was an idiot, um, but I had a flag. <laughs> you, know, you know, there are mornings now, I'm like, why didn't I buy that flag? And I was leaving government, I didn't buy it, and so I so wished, like, on a good summer day, I could hang it outside my house and wave my little assistant secretary flag. Um, but when you go to Boulder, Colorado, assistant secretary, they do fly your flag. You. There's a picture of me under my flag. Loved it. Your flag rank. But when you're dealing with spectrum, you're dealing with other people of flag rank, generals and, sec um, and, and admirals, and they have flags too. 
but they also have guns and they also have stars on their shoulders. So when you go to them and say they want their, um, their spectrum, they're not happy to see you. And they're gonna obfuscate and they're gonna take a very long time to give it up. We have to make sure that our, our, our war fighters, the people who protect our homeland, that our first responders have adequate spectrum. There's no denying that. But there's also no denying that we've not done an adequate job of inventorying or getting spectrum out into the hands of people who need it. When we were trying to get the internet into the government in 1995, Al Gore called a meeting with his cabinet officers per Bill Clinton's instructions. We all sat in a room and Al Gore said, in three months, I want you to tell me how you're gonna use the internet better, what you're gonna do in the agency, how you're gonna serve your customers better, and I want you to come back to me in three months. I wish the White House would bring the cabinet officers together and say, I want you to do a spectrum inventory. I want a real cost allocation. OMB and CBO are gonna actually say, the 18 billion, maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, but let's know what the real cost is. And you're going to tell us how you're gonna give the American people and the people you work for as a government official enough spectrum to do both, both things. If we don't have that kind of level, no assistant secretary, no secretary of commerce can do it by themselves. You're going to need, and if we talk about 500 megahertz over 10 years, you're talking 20, we've got all kinds of problems in terms of what we're gonna need. Now. That's the approach on the government side. Let's talk about the progressive community side, of which I'm proud to be a part of. I want everyone in this room to follow the advice of Steve Jobs. Think different. We don't need a new theory of public interest. Some things are just classic. A 1964 Ford Mustang. A Chanel little black dress. Marvin Gaye's What's Going On when you have a woman with a Chanel little black dress somewhere in, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You, you, you can tweak them, you can change them, but you're not going to improve them. We're not gonna prove the public interest standard. It stands the test of time. But we need to think again about the best way to achieve our collective goals. We need to think about how we're gonna not just continue but propel our technological progress. Because I believe the technology out, outstrips everything we're gonna do in terms of policy. We're gonna need unlicensed and commercial solutions to drive innovation and connectivity and to build the national networks. We don't have the money at the local, national, or federal level to build the infrastructure we need to continue the momentum we have in, 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 in broadband. And in the present toxic political envi environment here in Washington, in the hemorrhaging state budgets, that situation is not gonna change soon. I love unlicensed te technology. I use unlicensed technology. I think it's an important part of what we're gonna do. But I also think that licensed technology is as important. And we have this fundamental fight. If we can get more spectrum from the government and get that, put that spectrum to work, we can stop having these, these fights. We expand the pie rather than figuring out who's gonna fight over what slices over the pie. We don't have a business model that I've seen for rural and getting what we need to do in rural, including WISP. We're gonna need to work on that. And when I talk to some folks in Brooklyn and in Brownsville, there's a little bit of a disconnect with regard to our focus on unlicensed as progressives. It doesn't work as well in, at at-risk communities, and let me explain to you why. If you're black and brown, or black or brown and poor, and I go back to these neighborhoods at Christmas, so I know this, and I have family still there, and I know what's going on, you're less likely to have wide broadband at home. You have limited access to public facilities, schools and public libraries. My wife's hometown in Homewood, Rushton, the library's open one night a week. The schools aren't open at, at, for, for public access. There's little, if any, commercial Wi-Fi in most of those communities. It's not a, a Starbucks. There aren't these great things. So what happens in, in Cambridge, what happens in DuPont Circle, what happens in Palo Alto doesn't work. If you're talking about Southeast um, Queens, or you're talking about Brownsville, you're talking about Brownsville, Texas. So when you constrain commercial providers, the people you may be pointing at big commercial providers, you are hitting low-income people. I don't know anybody who doesn't have access to this if they want it in my family or in my community. I do know lots of folks who don't have access to unlicensed spectrum that's free in their neighborhood unless they're going to Bryant Park or they're going to Prospect Park, and most of the time it's those same providers who are providing those hotspots free. The commercial providers aren't doing what needed to be done, and there isn't enough public facilities there. So the criticism that I'm hearing from outside of Washington is that we're so busy fighting battles over and over again that we're not thinking outside the box. Look at the last 10 years, Google, YouTube, Facebook, Apple's iPad and iPhone. Each of them won because they thought outside the box. People said you can't do it, and they did it differently. There's a sense that, that within Washington, if, and this is what I was told last night from somebody whose name you'd know. If you give me the name of the speaker, I can tell you what he or she is going to say before he or she says it. I had a conversation with a guy who comes to DC office and said if I gave him the name or affiliation of a DC panelist, he could write their speech, put it in an envelope, open it after the speech and be 80% sure that what he said they were gonna say they actually said. That's insanity. Why aren't any of us thinking differently and getting, you know, we shouldn't be put in boxes. We need to figure out new ways of, 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 of addressing the issues we're all trying to face. New times require new thinking and new approaches. Let me give you one example. 15 years ago, 14, 15 years ago, we were talking about a laptop in every backpack. 
Even Newt Gingrich said, that's the idea, that's what we're gonna go for. And I remember Tom Wheeler, who's then head of CTIA, when it failed in Congress, Tom said, Newt fell, but he fell forward. He didn't fall, well, we won't go there. But, uh, but he <laughs> fell, but he, didn't, but he fell forward. So Obama transition, as is too often the case in technology circles, I was the only person of color in the room. I was probably the only person who had been born poor. Um, I was with a bunch of Ivy League academics, who are all transition people, or people that have transitioned and invited in. And we're talking about how are we going to address some issues of connectivity in education. And everybody in the room except me said, laptop and backup, laptop and backup. And I said, no, dudes, why aren't we talking about wireless technology? Why aren't we talking? This, the, the, iPad, the iPhone had come out, the iPad hadn't. But iPhone was clearly there. Apps were on the horizon. We'd just seen them. I said, let's think a little differently. Let's use. And I, and I said, come with me to a playground in Shore. Let's go to Anacostas. Go up to Bed-Stuy. The brothers and sisters have these. They don't have that. And they don't have it because they don't want it. You know, right now, I was talking to a friend of mine in Pittsburgh. My wife's from Pittsburgh. Comcast is having a hard time selling a $10 broadband to the home. It's not because people are stupid. It's because they made a different choice. They decided that they want to use wireless rather than use the broadband lines. I, I commend Julius what he did. I commend Comcast what they're doing. But you sometimes have to meet people where they are rather than where you think they want to be. So we spent this time talking about laptops and backpacks instead of trying to figure out how we can use these things and these things more effectively. Where would we be if we spent three and a half years as a community thinking differently, working with Apple, working with the carriers, and figuring out how to use these to their best practical effect? I think events have proved me right, and I don't want to gloat. I'm kind of sad for the time we've wasted. We have a chance right now to drive momentum. We have a chance to marshal all of our natural resources and providers in furtherance of a shared belief in the public interest. Australia came up with a gigaband network. And what I told when they did that is, the most important thing is in the network, it's what rides on top of the network. It's the apps, it's the ideas, it's the technologies. And it's the same thing here. If we can build out these networks, if we can let people free up the American people and the global community to drive what we want, instead of trying to manufacture it here in Washington or through policy. Networks matter. And we've got to make the investment. We've got to start thinking, how are we going to get hundreds of billions of dollars of investment? What's the right way to do that? And don't think about intramural squabbles. Think about that kid in Brownsville. Think about those folks trying to cure diabetes out of New York. Think about that Silicon Valley serial entrepreneur who just wants a network that'll work, that when he's standing at Menlo Park in Hanover, using a commercial network, he can't talk to his wife, much less send out a, um, a digital stream on social media. Sasha talked about. Um, his two-year-old daughter, and it reminded me of a story about a young girl and her dad. Dad came home from work, and he's told by his little daughter, a little bit older than Sasha's girl, and the daughter told him that Esther the turtle was dead. And the dad tried to console his daughter, because she didn't know what death was, first time she'd been exposed to death, and he said, I know what, we'll have a funeral. The little girl looked up at daddy and said, so daddy, what's a funeral? And dad explained, well, we're gonna invite all of your friends over, and we're going to tell funny stories and, and joke about Esther's life. And we're going to have cake. And we're going to have punch. Everybody's going to have a great time. And we're going to remember Esther for the great little turtle that she was. And just as the little girl's getting excited, Esther moved. <laughs> and the dad looked and said, Esther's alive. And the little girl looked at dad and said, Daddy, let's kill her. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I'm trying is, the, the point of that story, and here's the point of that story is, Esther's alive. Esther's in the momentum of our entrepreneurs. Esther's in the vibrancy of our conversation. But we need every, every part of our economy pulling toward this. I want all of you to continue working in the public interest. But I want all of us to get outside of our boxes. I spend most of my time, as I mentioned to, to, to Mark and to Ellen, outside of Washington. And I do it purposely. I do it because the, the environment here, the ad hominem, the ad hoc attacks on personal, why people do things, why they say they things do, it gets very old. Let's fight to make this a better country. Let's fight in the public interest. Let's use the momentum and the technology that we have to really serve the public interest. Let's go back to those touchstones. If you put three touchstones, I was listening to a story about um, uh, this morning as I was leaving the House, um, uh, Senate, uh, Secretary Powell, General Powell, was on TV. And he talked about he had aphorisms in his desk. He put little sayings. If you put public interest, universal service, and localism, and the power of the public interest on your desk, and you work every day toward those goals, and you stop thinking that, you know, that, that everybody else in the world isn't working toward those goals, we can get some great things done. But we're not going to get it done unless we start realizing that we don't have all the answers in Washington, the private sector has an important role to say, and that personality shouldn't trump progress. Thank you very much.